Roger, I understand Jim made you aware that Nick Kyrgios was commentating on your game today. I wonder if I could just share some of his thoughts and get you to respond. Federer's timing is scary good. He hits everything on the half volley. Oh my goodness, butter, so smooth. He's zoning at the moment. <laughs> yeah, we need him to play first before commentating for the next, uh, whatever, 10 plus years. But uh, now he's always good for a, for a headline. And uh, uh, look, I like Nick. Um, I like the way he plays and all that. So um, yeah, I was, I was happy to hear that he was in the commentary booth. You know, he's got a bit of time, he sticks around. Um, shows that he's passionate about the game and all that, that's what we need to see. But of course we wish he was on the court rather than in the commentary booth. But I hope he did a good job. <laughs> Roger, you play a lot of night matches, sometimes very late. What is, how much different is it on your mind, your body, maybe even your spirit playing at 1 p.m. versus 1 a.m.? Uh, I mean, look, you, I think for me nowadays I go in phases where um, sometimes I don't see day matches for a long time, you know, especially Dubai, let's just say the matches are always at night, you know, the, I mean, for the top guys. So um, here with the semis and finals and quarters, if you play well here, you're always going to see three, four night session matches, same thing. And um, and in Wells and Miami, they're also 50-50 spread out. So next thing you know, it's like you're... By the time you hit the clay, with those normal clay court matches, you know you've played 70% maybe in the night. So, uh, and the weird thing is we never practice at night. You know, we're always, um, you know, for schedule it's just easier to to play during the daytime. And I remember early on in my career, I played much more in like especially in America. I think early on because of uh, because of the time change to Europe with Eurosport being. Uh, the host broadcaster. I remember that that happened a lot, and so, so I've worked my way into the night, I guess. You know, but for me, um, playing early at like one one o'clock definitely needs a little bit of a change. You know, I just think uh, uh, with my age, I just need extra extra warm up, extra, you know, care to details. So I'm actually really firing at uh, at one p.m. Roger, you, you've said yourself, age is just a number. And somebody else that thought exactly the same thing was the great Jamaican sprinter, Merlene Otte. She ran her personal best at the age of 36, Olympic silver medalist at the age of 40, semi-finalist at 44, misqualifying at 48, ran under 12 seconds at 52. Mm. She's still competing at the age of 58. There you go. I won't do that. that but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm, do you think, looking at those kind of numbers, do you think your best might be yet to come? No, I don't think so. I think the, the last 10 have been a lot of fun, maybe more fun than the first 10. I'm not sure, but... Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't think with four children and with the career that I've had, and my body, I want it to be somewhat healthy and healthy actually when I retire. Um, I don't think that's a good idea, you know, to be quite honest. So, uh, yeah, for the time being, it's all good. The, the lights are on green. Um, I'm injury free. I'm enjoying myself. The kids are having a great time too on the tour. Uh, my wife's happy. So for the moment, there's absolutely no complaints and no plans. So I'm just uh, happy where I am in my, in my life and my career right now. So, but these numbers are definitely uh, something else. Yeah, unreachable numbers. <laughs> um, just on the night sessions, yesterday Conta and Muguruza finished at 10 past 3 in the morning. Um, I mean, I know we've, we've seen that before, but yeah. there was hardly anyone here watching. Do you think it's good for tennis to have play at that time, or should something be, be done with the scheduling to try and prevent that? What do you want me to tell you? I mean, uh, I think for the people in the stadium, there was a few, you know, they, they were happy. People on the TV, they were happy that still tennis was going on. Um, is it ideal? No, it's not. But sometimes what can you do um, if you schedule a match, at, especially a men's match before, and that thing goes, you know, four or five hours and it can happen, you know, as we saw also with Sverev and Chardy that played a great match. I don't know what other choices you have. I mean, you could move them on an outside court, but then, you know, the atmospheres might be quite sad, you know, if you put them on the outside court. So I think it is what it is. And they also played a long match. So um, you just deal with it, you move on, you know, that's not going to happen again. Um, they're going to try to um, help you out with scheduling the next time that you play, maybe later in the evening again, so you stay somewhat in that rhythm. 
So I think that the tournament tries to accommodate that kind of a situation. I also went after the first day, and I didn't even finish so late, but I also went to bed at 3.15 or 3.30. So it's just what we do. And uh, I think as tennis players, you have to be flexible, in, especially in the head. Uh, we don't know if you play at 11 or at 1 or super late. Um, it's not like a team sport where you know the kickoff time is at a certain time. We're used to playing three games in the juniors a day. So this is kind of part of our life, and we actually like it like this. <laughs> and there's no solution, I think. Uh, could you talk about your next opponent, Yeah, I, I'm happy I played against him in, at the Hopman Cup. Um, I think he played really well there. I actually did too. I thought it was really high, high quality tennis. This is obviously... A different type of match, being it, it being best of five, it being a fourth round of a of a slam, you know, where we know now how we feel on this court. Um, I think he had to work extremely hard against uh, Basilashvili again today because he hits hard, and I saw him before I went out, you know, really defending well and a lot. So uh, um, yeah, I'm happy for him. He's playing so well, and I'm I'm looking forward to the. The matchup with him, I think it's going to be a good one. You know, I like how he mixes up his game and also comes to the net. So will I, and I think we'll see some athletic uh, attacking tennis, you know, being played. Roger, um, injuries are obviously bad, but it seems like in this sport more than any other, players benefit from maybe long layoffs, getting away from the tour. It's bad edge this week. Talked a lot about it. Son Stevens, whoever. Um, from from your, I guess, why do you think that is? And. Also thinking back to 2017, maybe that was also the case with you, kind of refreshing you a bit. And the question is about having a long break? Yeah, like what what is it about tennis that makes it that when some players get away from the sport for a long period, it refreshes them even more than, say, training for six months? Well, I mean, like I think every, every sport is somewhat of an off-season. I mean, we have two, but you can't really, I mean, count it uh, like that. But... I think, uh, let's not talk scheduling during this tournament, I think it's, there's no point, there's no perfect solution there too, but uh, what I think it is good about our sport is that it sort of is going all year round, is if you do get injured, you can always jump back into it and you don't have to wait for another five months just because there's no tournament going on. So I think there's also very uh, much positives about our long schedule that we have. But I think when you've been on the tour, like, uh, like Burdich or myself, and you know, played full seasons for many, many years, and you take a long break uh, off. Um, Prof has had them, you know, through injuries. Mostly they come through injuries naturally. I think it just uh, um, gives the body a chance to sort of heal itself and maybe also the mind to really take a step back. And, uh, and when you come back to the tour and back, uh, you see the guys and you step in the press room, the way you deal with, um, I don't know, you know, the pressure, all of a sudden you see things maybe either more clear or. Um, more relaxed instead of, you know, there's so many trees that you can't see anymore where you're at, you know. And I think all of a sudden it's much more clear. And I hope that Thomas is there now. And I think that's maybe also why he's playing well. And, uh, you know, and minor tweaks and adjustments can make a, a big difference at the end of the day in our sport. You know, the margins are super slim. So it'll be interesting to, to follow him. And those guys who do tend to take a, a bigger break, it's just hard because. Your rankings always, because we have a one-year rolling ranking, as you know how it is, it's just a tough one because your ranking's going to drop, and if you don't play well when you do come back, well, I mean, you're going to be in no man's land in the ranking, and uh, you're going to pay the price dearly for it, and can you always come back to top 10 or top 20? It's not always a guarantee, so it's, you have to be very confident in, in maybe taking that decision. You know. Thank you. Uh, Roger, I saw you first winning a tournament when you were 16 years and eight months in Florence, junior tournament. I'd like to know if you remember most of the finals that you have played in your career. I mean, 91, uh, 99 tournaments won. Would you say, remember something of each finals or uh, each player that you played at least in the finals? So probably not. So you would lose uh, many if you don't remember. I think I would remember something definitely of, of every finals that I did play. And I remember the finals in Florence. I still remember how the center court looked. And I think it was maybe Volandri I played in the finals. So I do. <laughs> so, yes, you, you, you do remember those big time matches, you know. Um, there's always something about it because it got you nervous or it got you thinking. Um, the hardest are the sort of the second, third, fourth rounds, you know, at certain tournaments, you know. So I think those are the ones that you just, uh, 
you're trying to get by, and when you do get by, you're right away the next match comes around, and I don't know, you don't have time to think about that one. But you know, usually finals, won or lost, you take it with you to the next on the trip. You know, so you have more time to think about that one. Hmm. Uh, Roger, one of the other things Nick Kyrgios said when on commentary was that he sometimes thinks you hit shots almost deliberately so that they're going to be on a shot uh, show reel later or a highlights reel or social media i mean are there, are there times when you hit a shot and you think yeah that was pretty good we'll be seeing a lot of that later on uh, not really no um i think i learned that early on in my career that um, if you're on center court just play your game and good shots are going to happen because um, i don't know you become You've worked hard in your game, and you've come fast and athletic, and you inevitably have to hit good shots uh, that maybe make the highlight reel. But looking for them, I think, is always the wrong, um, the wrong take. Um, I mean, uh, yes, what I do sometimes, and I did it in the third set at one point, is I tried to relax and start playing more drop shots and playing more serve and volley. Even did the Sabre ones, just to see how did it feel, how did what is their opponent going to do. But I don't do it deliberately to make their opponent look bad or to be on the highlight reel because uh, I felt I was like this when I was younger, you know, a teenager coming through on the tour, and I was trying to do these great shots on court 17, and you're like, nobody cares, nobody <laughs> cares. You know, you have to be on center court to hit those, you know. So, um, so that's where um, I, uh, that's the mindset I've had since a very, very long time. Yeah.